Hey everyone, welcome to But Why the Podcast, the podcast where we talk about the things in pop culture that people say matter and ask the question, but why though? Before we get started, we wanted to make sure that you take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe us on iTunes or wherever you listen. It's the easiest way for people to find us and it helps us hear your feedback. Beyond that, come and join our conversation on Twitter at But Why Though PC and on Facebook, facebook.com slash But Why Though PC. And if you like what you're doing and you want to support us a little more, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash But Why Though PC. And if a monthly subscription is too much for you, make sure you check out our t shirts. We have t shirts open on Tee Public and available for purchase on our website through the merch tab, But Why Though Podcast.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, and today we're talking about a television series that revolutionized the way people think about nature and even impacted a lot of conservation efforts. We're talking about Planet Earth 1 and 2. As always, I'm your host, Kate, and I'm here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And I'm here with Matt. Hello. And we have a special science guest today, an ecologist, uh, Quinn. Hello. <laughs> so why don't you give our listeners a little bit of your background working with ecology and what ecology means for those who don't know. Uh, well, so as, I, as Kate said, I'm an ecologist. Uh, I'm currently uh, working on a master's degree in ecosystem science and management at Texas A&M. Um, and my research right now is actually in fire ecology. And the basic definition of ecology is the study of the interactions between plants, animals, and their environment and why it's important. Cool. So you're qualified. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, our own resident scientist, Matt, will be leading the charge on going through planet Earth and I'll probably just be crying in the background for a <laughs> bunch of this. Um, so yeah, Matt, take it over. Okay, so for this episode, we're pretty much gonna have Basically, the main botanist or scientist of me, the happy one of Quinn, yeah. Kate crying, and Adrian just going, I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty accurate, <laughs> except I think all scientists are mean, given how y'all responded to things dying on that show. It's, so, yeah. you know. it's something you learn. <laughs> so, basically, to start off as we always start off, I have a question how we do on the show and I'm like actually I have two questions so the, first, the questions are have you watched planet earth before and do you ever watch any types of these type of documentaries of science uh i guess nature i'll go first i hadn't watched planet earth before because i knew it was going to make me cry so i avoided it <laughs> but uh i watched it with with Matt uh, for the past week just working way through one and two in the episodes um and Surprise! I did just cry and yell at the TV a whole bunch. Um, but I do actually watch these types of documentaries a lot just because I actually really like nature and I really like like studying those types of... They're not studying those types of things. I didn't study it. Like The most I got was like uh, primate evolution and like that type of stuff in anthropology. But I just really like seeing knowing more about animals because I think as humans we tend to just act like they're nothing and we're better. And in a lot of ways, like that's not really that true when you look at the intricacies of like how they live. Um, so yeah, I'm watching a dogs one right now in the Curiosity Stream called The Secret Life of Dogs and learning all about how my baby is really a baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is it my turn? Sorry, yes. I didn't know if Matt was. You know how Matt is. I, I didn't want to like skip ahead and go out of turn, uh, or he'll yell at me in Science Man. No, talk. no, no, no. <laughs> science. He'll yell at you. <laughs> big yell at science. So yells in science. Yeah, basically. <laughs> oh God, that should be a shirt. He's yells like, in science. It's like rude, but science. Yeah. Just science. Uh, so, 
I didn't know that I would watch Planet Earth. So when I was going back and watching the episodes on Netflix, I was like, oh, I've seen this episode before. Um, so I've seen Planet Earth kind of like sporadically back like when I was like in middle school. And, you know, they actually showed uh, science stuff on Animal Planet and Not Discovery cat, Channel. No. Yeah. Uh, so like back when like Discovery Channel, History Channel, that stuff, you just show documentaries on animals and like the most extreme and, you know, things like that. Um, I was totally, totally into it because I love um, I love animals. Um, I love seeing what animals do. And watching Planet Earth, uh, all I think about is that episode in Family Guy when Peter's watching the documentary and the guy's just like, damn, nature, you scary. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Which is true. It's accurate. Very true. It's extremely yeah. accurate. Yeah, so I love stuff like this. I love watching animals. Um, I'd much rather watch, like, an animal documentary than, like, uh, a people documentary. And that's even coming from someone who majored in history. Because I also took primate evolution in uh college and i really really enjoyed it long story short i like watching animals on tv uh doing animal things whether that be like eating other animals or just like living their life uh i'm all about it so we <laughs> so want quinn to go next or you want me to go next you go next okay so uh obviously since i'm waiting the episode i had watched planet earth one before long long time ago i don't know if i watched it when it first exactly came out i want to say i did but at least within the first year or so i'm pretty sure i actually watched the original version and not the u.s one which we'll get to i think um i've watched a lot of these documentaries as far but they're technically not my despite like i guess studying a lot of like ecology and biology stuff they're not my favorite for the most part when i watch curiosity stream which by the way everybody should have um, I usually watch uh, a lot of math and particle physics physics in parallel universes and quantum entanglement shows. I don't know if that's a good or bad representation of all the time I've studied biology, but for some reason I watch those way more than I do a lot of the animal documentaries. Well, like, that kind of makes sense because like I don't watch like I don't like watching documentaries on the stuff I studied. Like it, I'm like I know this. Why yeah. am I going to watch this? <laughs> no, yeah, I think that's a common theme. I think we've all said it. Like I don't watch history stuff. Because it's, I know that stuff. I want to watch stuff I don't know about. Yeah, so I guess that, opposite. I, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, three out of four, you know. Yeah. I think that. I mean, like, like I watch pop culture stuff a whole bunch, but I won't watch stuff that like, I'm, yeah, I don't watch like, I did a lot of studying on Islam and evangelical like Christianity. I'm not, I'm not gonna watch anything about this stuff. I've already spent like eight years of my life doing this. I don't, I don't need it on my TV. <laughs> the funny thing is, Adrian brought up about like the TV and how the channels evolved. I guess, and for the most part, it's funny because when I remember when I was still, I guess, in college or whatever, back home, we actually had cable. Um, I actually watched the Science Channel more than I ever watched Discovery Channel or Planet Earth or even thing. I always watched the Science Channel, National Geographic, and uh, BBC more than I did any of the actual like big name ones like History Channel, Discovery Channel, or even The Learning Channel. Yeah. We didn't have like the extended cable packages, so it was just Nat Geo and History Channel. Yeah. But Pawn Stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so important. Yes. So how about our actual, I guess, ecologist, even though she likes... You guess ecologist? <laughs> I am one. Yeah. Damn you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I watched, you know, what, Planet Earth uh, 1 came out like 10 years ago. So yeah, I definitely watched it back then. Um and I've been watching this, you know, documentaries and just, you know, animal shows, uh, not domesticated animal school, you know, shows, wildlife animal shows since, you know, I think I came out of the womb. And the reason for it, uh, where, I, you know, I started so young was um, it was kind of a family thing. Uh, we had Animal Planet and National Geographic mostly. And we, you know, as a family would all just sit down and watch these tv shows and i think that's where my obsession started <laughs> and so now i'm here getting you know you know further into you know my graduate uh, education and i'm still loving ecology and i still watch these sorts of shows because like when it comes to you know our natural world obviously um you know i watch other things like the history channel 
and I'm interested. So Vikings. Yes, Vikings. Yeah, <laughs> mostly Vikings. Yeah, that's history, right? Um, <laughs> and, I hate I hate those channels so much. <laughs> um, it, oh, Vikings man. is a great show, though. But yeah, it but does it need to be on History Channel? Does not belong on History Channel. Jesus. Um, and I like aerospace science and stuff like that, but. Uh, when it comes to our natural world, we're still learning so much about it. And there's so many different, you know, I can talk about, you know, a grassland biome in South America versus, you know, in Kansas or, you know, up north, uh, you know, a tundra biome. But those biomes are so drastically different, even though the, the main vegetation is grassland. Yeah. So there's just so much variety that I just can't get enough of it, honestly. So I will say this just real quick. Um... For, I mean, I know a lot of people, like, if they don't continue into science, like, they may forget a lot of, like, their, like, middle school, high school science, which is where I learned what biome means. Um, so, it's not a common term. Uh, you want to explain what a biome is? I thought it was a common oh, term. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, well, no, I, I, no, I think it is, too, but I've also been in conversations, like, what's a biome? So, like, which I did, like, if you don't understand, I, I, okay, I'm going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that so out. Like, like, if somebody doesn't understand it, it's going to get kind of offended by that. I think you um, need to explain that you're with a scientist, so you hear terms like that much more often than yeah, like a normal exactly. person. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, explain what a biome is for, you know, people who don't deal with science every day or maybe just don't really care to watch these things. Yeah, so it's it's essentially a landscape that has very similar climate and usually um, just very similar characteristics when it comes to, say, like, uh, type of soil, um, what sorts of vegetation is there, um, the, uh, I guess the, uh, what is it called? <laughs> the the structure of, uh, like, uh, God, what is, what is it called? Food webs, thank you. Sorry. The biodiversity? Um, <laughs> yes, the biodiversity, the structure of the food webs. Um, yeah. So, is like, desert, more... grassland. Yeah, those types. are very basic biomes, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks for calling me basic, Quinn. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we know that's It's in not term true. of endearment, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure. Okay, so now that we all basically talked about our animal experiences growing up and how much we watch probably too much TV, uh, we'll go on to basically we'll start this episode with probably a little background just on planet Earth and 1 and 2, and then the probably majority of this is going to be spent on probably the but why those and how this series did a lot of things. So just to start off, planet Earth 1 was in 2006, basically 10, almost, well, about 12 years now, produced by BBC at 11 episodes, and it covers most of the different biomes as we kind of explain in general um in the original version there's actually been narr- narrated by david attenborough who basically hopefully everybody knows who that is yep. but the u.s version of course we don't grab actual scientists to do our stuff we have sigourney weaver <laughs> <laughs> wait really yes <laughs> yes i haven't seen planet Earth two yet I did no. not know that. Why did Sigourney Weaver? <laughs> Why? It was the first one. It was the first one, Adrian. Yeah. The U.S. got the... Sigourney Weaver. And... I do. Yeah, I must have watched the BBC one because I did not listen to Sigourney yeah, Weaver. Yeah, I didn't either. I didn't know this until I did the research on this that she actually did the U.S. version. Yeah. Which I think this may just tell us how America views science. <sighs> we'll get into yeah, more nope. celebrity stuff later in the But Why Those. <laughs> I mean, like, if you're if you're gonna get if it's like a celebrity thing, like, why didn't you just get like Morgan Freeman or someone that like has like a sultry voice kind of similar to, to David. Like, why'd you get Sigourney Weaver? Which, by the understand. way, Morgan Freeman did a show on the Science Channel called Into the Wormhole, which is actually great. Yeah. It is amazing. It's su- But it's also great. his voice. You can't doubt his voice. Like, March of the Penguins 2 is on Hulu right now. I'm going to go watch that because Morgan Freeman <laughs> is narrating yeah. it again. Not that I don't like Sigourney the Weaver. the elephant baby went the wrong way. <laughs> don't even <laughs> let's not talk about that, please. All right, so get back. I do not need to cry. I, I'm just saying I would podcasting. Right I'm just now. saying I would feel better about that baby elephant going the other way if it was Morgan Freeman telling me than you know. All I know Sigourney is Weaver. you're bringing it up, and I'm having it in my head, and I want to cry right now because <laughs> nobody helped that baby. So let's just please get through the rest of the stuff without you bringing that up. Kate will probably cry at least one time during this episode. Whether she leaves it in or not, we don't know. All right, so. I don't know, I'm gonna cut it out. <laughs> So, according to IMDb, 
This is like uh, Planet Earth One is a high, tied with the highest rated TV series uh, according to them at basically a nine point five. Both this and Planet Earth Two are tied for the highest rated shows they have, and Band of Brothers apparently. Um, Band of Brothers is. Ridiculous. Well, I didn't want to say it was bad, but it is one of those. The three basically all have nine point fives into the highest rated TV series, even though it's kind of weird because they're all mini series, but still, per se. Um, during this time, it won four primetime at primetime Emmys at in cinematography, music, nonfictional series, and sound editing. It was also won eleven other awards from various shows, including like a Peabody Award, Royal TV yeah, Royal TV Society Award, and it was nominated for fifteen other awards. So these this show came out and won a ton of stuff. Was nominated. A uh, few fun facts just about Planet Earth One. The project took basically four, uh, 40 camera teams shooting over two at over 200 locations all over the world for more than five years. That's one thing that you'll learn in a lot of these documentaries, especially Planet Earth, that it these things aren't made in a day, not even a year. Most of these take almost between three and five years to make this stuff. And that's just getting the footage. Uh, it also was the most expensive nature documentary series ever commissioned by BBC at the time. And it was the first series ever filmed in high definition. So all I want to know is why does the BBC care about getting this out and we get my cat from hell? Because as you watch a lot of these shows, you'll learn when they talk about uh, basically humans interacting with nature, it's usually not in the, in the Americas. <laughs> um, so uh, any other things about Planet Earth 1? It's just a broad uh, kind of summary of a thing before I go into Planet Earth 2. I just want to make this really quick on like the background of it before we get into talking about the actual shows. I would correct that though, because like, it, you mean North America, right? Because like, I see a lot of interaction on these things from South America, and the Americas is all of it. Well, okay. I was just actually thinking of like the actual United States of America more than anything. Yeah. So just say like, yeah, yeah. Say United. Yeah. States. I'm sorry. We only <laughs> pronounce things Canada America. It's else. America. Get it right. Okay, say that America. <laughs> with an doesn't make these with either a U. Or an E. <laughs> <laughs> Both are correct. Okay. Um, so, moving on to Planet Earth 2, which is really 10 years later. It was in 2016. Also produced by the BBC. Which, by the way, if you've never watched anything by the BBC, they do amazing documentaries. And I will also recommend... That's all that's on Curiosity. Yeah, and you should look up, definitely, Curiosity Stream for $3 a month. It's amazing. I would totally recommend that to anybody. They do anywhere between history, civilizations... Um, Math, science, like a biology world, uh, physics, they cover everything. It's amazing. It's definitely just actual learning documentary. Uh, so Planet Earth 2, they only did six episodes. They cover semi some of the biomes. I think they just pick general like landscapes more than the actual biomes. Also narr narrated back again, David Attenborough. As I said before, this is also tied for the highest rated TV series on IMDb. This one... Apparently only won two Emmy Awards for Best Non-Fictional Series in Cinematography. It only won nine other awards and was nominated for 19 other awards. So basically between the two, they won essentially, uh, what is it, 15 plus 11, <laughs> 26 awards. <laughs> and, and obviously 30 plus nominations. Some fun facts about this one. Hans Zimmer actually composed the music for the new series. Um, and this project was shot in 40 different countries with the crew making uh, 117 fil film trips, over 2,000 days of total shooting, and this one over a five, I say 5.7 years nonstop. <laughs> so this obviously took over five years. And this one was actually the first series to be filmed in ultra high definition of 4K. So that's pretty much the rundown of Planet Earth 1 and 2. So do you guys have anything else about it? Hopefully we all saw it. just want to give some basic information for those who are unfamiliar with this actual series. Nope. Okay. Nope. I haven't seen Planet Earth 2, but do you know who does – is like someone big do the the um, the score for Planet Earth 1? As far as I know of, no. That was – I did not know. They no. definitely won some, obviously, some music award, but it didn't seem like anybody yeah. big, at least it, from what I saw. I could be wrong because I'm not you know in the music thing. But it definitely didn't think anybody as big as like Hans Zimmer or like, uh, was it Jimmy Williams? <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. I was just checking just because I was when I was watching the episodes last night. I was like, man, this music is really, really, really. Yeah, really no, good. the music in this stuff is pretty it, damn well done. All right, so get over that. We'll get into the but why though. The main chunk of probably this episode. 
So the first thing we'll probably go with is like the impact. So as I said before, these are the two highest rated shows and award winning documentary series. Maybe not ever, but pretty close to ever. Uh, it's also probably the most well known. So ever asking the general audience, they may not even have seen planet earth. They may or anything else, but they know what it is for most part. Cause especially when that first one came out. And also the big thing is it led to a numerous series. They have like an entire like family series of BBC that kind of come out, including like blue planet, which is one and two, which just released not that long ago. Uh, frozen planet. They actually came out with a mini series kind of right after planet earth. Uh, called Planet Earth Future, which they talk about some of the detrimental effects of it from like all the filming and stuff they saw that they casually leaved out, left out. And then obviously Saving Planet Earth. So this one, not that there wasn't any more documentary before then or anything, but this was like the big like public one of like we can get the public and general audiences interested in like Earth and everything else that led to a lot of the other stuff. <laughs> Um, the other big thing, if you ever watch this series and stuff, is the cinematography. They won plenty of awards for this, but it's amazing. It's gorgeous. Obviously, they were the first series of the time, you know, like I said, to do like ultra, or do, yeah, excuse me, do high definition and then ultra high definition. But even with not, they're just, just the shots alone of what they're covering, the footage they get is unbelievable. Uh, Planet Earth 1 usually is more above views in these like helicopters. Basically, they made these special airborne cameras that was used with like a 400 millimeter lens that was able to zoom into single animals from like a kilometer away without disturbing them. And they also use this stabilization technology. So Quinn will probably be able to tell us more about some of this technology. So I'm just going to give a thing because she does a lot more cinematography than I do. Yeah, that was my big thing because, I mean, I haven't seen Planet Earth 2, so I don't, um, I'm not familiar with kind of like the angles in that one. But just watching Planet Earth 1, I'm just sitting there like wondering how they get, how they got those shots. Um, like the one with like with the baby panda, when the mom has the baby panda. And I was like, how did they get in there so close? <laughs> and like, without disturbing the baby panda. Or did they disturb the baby panda? I it, it was all just really crazy. And I'd love to hear more about like how they actually got the shots. I just want to put that in there. Before, I didn't want to say that after. The fact. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Educate me. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So, as Matt mentioned, in Planet Earth 1, they use these kind of, I think they're called God's Eye View, you know, from helicopter. They, uh, you know, they remove themselves from these, you know, the organisms so that they're not uh, disturbing so them. So, before she goes more, kind of the same, kind of like Quinn, you can kind of agree on, talk about more. The main thing that, obviously, Kate's had a problem with some of these shows, but when you film these things, you do not want to disturb the wildlife at all. One, it's just biology 101, for the most part, when you're doing the stuff, but also within these documentaries. Just not being, a, yeah. Being able to do all this without disturbance is your main goal and priority. You want to see it. As just save the animals. <laughs> just save the animals. You're right there. You can tell that that you can tell that group of fucking penguins that are about to freeze to death to go back to their family and tell them where to go. Or just make the elephant go in the other direction. Yeah, you're right there. Now the elephant's probably dead. That, that elephant is probably disturbing. dead. David Attenborough said he was gonna die. Yeah, I'm. I would be a terrible, terrible, terrible scientist. They're not even scientists doing these things. They're just taking freaking movies. <laughs> <laughs> so now that I got that out there, uh, Quinn, can you like back me up on this on the non-disturbing part before you go in more? Yeah, the the main the main idea is not to disturb some some animals. Um, they were able to get very close to, and you know the animals kind of just ignore the people. They're not disturbed, um, and you know, like in the Planet Earth two, uh, they got that serval cat. They were right up close to that serval cat, and the serval just didn't care. So in those situations. Um, you can get pretty close to the animals, but most animals, when you get close to them, you disturb them, you change their behavior, and they don't want anything to do with you, and they run away. They, they try to get away from you, so obviously you can't film them if that happens. Um, but so for Planet Earth 2, if you notice, there's a lot more close-ups and you know these lower camera angles, and they were able to get this by using a lot of like the remote recording um, techniques that have, uh, I mean, been used for years, like trap cameras, but also recent technology, like using aerial drones, um, to get close to these animals and not disturb them in any way. So for, sorry, for people who do not know what trap cameras are, cause obviously you and I have used them before, but for other, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, for us little <laughs> folks who don't know nothing about no trap cameras. Can you please tell me what a trap camera is so I don't have to Google it? Uh, yeah, so trap cameras are essentially these cameras that are set up in uh, boxes that you attach to, for example, a tree or some sort of structure um, and have a sensor on it. So if, you know, an animal walks in front of it, it, you know, either goes off and takes a picture or multiple pictures, or in this case, it, it records. Um, so they used a lot of that. Uh, they also had, they've, from, going from planet Earth 1 to 2, they have also had improved camera stabilization. And in planet Earth 1, they used as I said, most of the stabilization in a helicopter, but recently they've come out with these, uh, these body rigs, um, that has increased stabilization, but to go even a step further for planet earth two, they have these, uh, handheld camera rigs that, uh, have gyroscopes in them. So you only need two hands to operate it and you can go from, you know, putting your hands up into the air with the camera to get a high view to putting it on the ground, you know, to look at the penguins. So it's, you know, a lot less cumbersome. And the and gyroscope just adjusts it to where it needs to go. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very, very smooth transition, and you can use two hands to move these these cameras around, and it just seems so uh, smooth and seamless. Um, so that helped a lot with uh, Planet Earth 2. Um, Let's see, they, they also had these uh, improved night vision cameras where they, they, of course, had these track cameras that were set up with IR sensors, but they also used uh, these red dragon cameras that aren't, weren't originally supposed to do uh, since IR, but they actually removed a filter um, on this camera so that it could use, or it could sense IR. So IR um, is infrared? Yes. Yeah, infrared, yes. Um, so they kind of MacGyvered it, which was pretty cool. And then in general, um, they, they used, so as, as camera technology has advanced, you see cameras that come out with these really large sensors, and the larger the sensor in your camera, the more light it can pick up. So they use this uh, Sony camera that is actually, uh, came out on the market and is really cheap for what it is, but its sensor is so large that it just allows the camera to pick up more light. So it's more light sensitive and you can use it under like dark canopies. So like when you're in the jungle or um, you can use it at times with low light. So like you're dawn and you're dusk. So it would be like the example of like when people just like, oh, I want to take a picture of the moon. Then they go take a picture of it and then it comes out and it looks awful. <laughs> yeah. So you need to. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it helps with those times um, at low light. Not quite complete right. dark, but low light situations. So those, uh, those little, like, smudges of the, of the blood moon a couple of years yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and this is, of course, the first time in Planet Earth 2 that they actually shot in HD. So I think some of the cameras actually went all the way up to 6K, not just 4K in Planet Earth 2, which is just amazing. And so, what about the um, the ocean shots? Do, what kind of cameras do they use for those? Is there anything like special technology that they have to have to like? Yeah, it's mostly still helicopters. Um, they're still using the same uh, stabilization technology with that 400 millimeter lens um, attached to the helicopter. Um, I'm sure they can also. They're still also using uh, the aerial drone technology. Um, no, I'm talking about like when they're in the water. Oh, in like, the water. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, what kind of? Like, so sorry. I'm just sorry, just, no, no, you're good. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, do the subs, the subs that they use, like when they're going, because we watched um, the the deep, the deep ocean yeah. one for our final episode last night, and they're, you know, you know, miles underwater with no light. So, mm-hmm. do are they using the same type of cameras that you're talking about, or do they have to have like special like underwater cameras or something? So, like that? I know there's specialized underwater cameras. I don't know um, specifically about such deep depths, but when you saw um, in in Planet Earth two, they do have some submersed cameras. Uh, they use particularly that Sony camera, um, which had the huge sensor because once you go underwater, you know the light gets filtered out, so it's a low light. Um, area, so they needed a camera with a larger sensor. Uh, but most of that, most of those shots weren't, you know, they were only a few feet deep, you know, under the water. They weren't, you know, completely submerged, you know, a mile down. So I don't know about those cameras specifically. No problem. Just curious. <laughs> 
Because they just they just they just had some like really cool like um a, un, like when they're under you know the like the swordfish or like, uh yeah. you know hunting the tuna. There's just the shots of them going looking up were just super cool. I just didn't know if they did that in some fancy way or if it's just um. Just yeah. camera stuff. I, I know that they do have specialized cameras and hell they, they have these specialized cameras that usually have like a propulsion system to them. So they literally, you know, put it in front of them and, you know, press a button and it propels them forward too. So they definitely have specialized cameras that they can use that deep as well because it, all the pressure they need they definitely either need a case around it that uh, can, you know, withstand all of that pressure. Yeah. So yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Which kind of leads to probably the <laughs> yeah, main no. thing of this is this is probably one of the most beautiful, beautifully well done series and documentary probably I would say almost ever made. Obviously, some of them they pretty much use the same technology, but especially for like the original Planet Earth one when it came out, just the amazing footage, as you said, even getting underneath the water and just how close it looks like you actually are that you feel really immersed within the area and with the animal. Because there's there's because there's never really been anything like before this like this was kind of like the first one that started doing that type of immersion as right as far as i know of i know obviously there are documentaries to do it and they get close but i just don't remember seeing one before this that looked like this amazing and like i guess spectacle yeah, yeah. cinematographic yeah. And, like just yeah. beautiful yeah like, yeah quality. it's like yes movie quality <laughs> not like a person who studies cougars is going to get Yeah, I was like, I've seen and used those trap cameras, <laughs> and those look like black and white came from, like, the 40s. You get the footage you want, but it's yeah. not like, oh, you look at it and you're like, this is ugly as can be. It's not appealing. It gets your what you're looking for and your goals, obviously, because, honestly, we don't really care what it looks like as long as we know the animals are there most of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, I mean, those trap cameras cost, like, $30 versus the cameras they used, you know, are upwards of, like, $30,000, <laughs> yeah. so... It's a big difference in the quality just based off of how much they cost. (laughs) Yeah. Plus, it makes sense, too, because, like, people are drawn to this, like, maybe not for the science first, but because, oh, look at the pretty animal. Pretty much. That was, I think, their main goal with making Planet Earth 1 was they wanted to, like, show all this. And they obviously, they wanted to tell these, like, stories with this, like, amazing music and, like, like footage in the thing. That was their whole goal was to get people generally interested in, like, what is going on around the obviously earth which kind of leads into the next but why the, like this uniqueness because um uh, as much as we said like we can learn things from this from these episodes they talk about you know various species and whatnot but you don't you're, it's not like you're going into like a biology class or a wildlife class or even like a botany type class a lot of this is literally just storytelling and immersion of just like what is going on so they'll pick like a random bird and they'll show you like it's mating ritual and whatnot and they kind of tell this david attenborough tells this beautiful story of like everything that's going through and yeah you say that but yet when he was telling me about the mating ritual of the pygmy pygmy sloths he had to make sure to say and there's only a hundred of them and they're probably we will get to this (laughs) (laughs) but (laughs) It's not just storytelling. Yeah, it's no, so I, I, I like. I, I think I think I agree with you there, man. Like, it's not. It's. I don't know if there's a word for like storytelling, learning, but I don't know. It's like this weird blend of like him talking and just giving you information about the animals that you can kind of go like tell your friends about in like a very easy way. And he's not telling you because you know you've taken you know primate classes. Like a lot of that stuff is really intricate and people wouldn't care about it but they just do it in a way whoever wrote you know what he's what he's saying put it in a way that you can go tell someone that there's only a hundred sloths left but you can also tell them a whole bunch of other cool stuff about their mating rituals yeah no no like i completely agree like i do like like he teaches he like they treat each of these animals like it's their own little character in the story and they tell you all the story but they also tell you that they're all gonna die (laughs) like they also tell me all the things that i need to know about how horrible humans are i've had a very rough emotional like guys okay everything dies calm down I know they do, but humans are causing these things to die, and then they die. There's no. There's to be no more to be left. fair, you will it's spend gone. more time dead than you it's will gone. alive, and there are more people dead than there are alive. <laughs> like ninety eight percent of all species Jesus. are already dead. Yeah, but humans aren't extinct yet. There's only a hundred freaking pygmy sloths. That's about to be extinct. Okay. Like, there's more of us. Okay, okay. I, I know, I know. Like, We're, we will get there. Let us keep going. I know this has been very traumatic for you. 
<laughs> but the re- <laughs> the real value in a lot of this stuff happening is you get to go and experience a lot of places that humans have rarely been in a lot of these remote areas without the actual human destruction that you kind of were mentioning upon. Like they go to this remote island for a lot where you see like um, there's over a million penguins. Obviously, humans don't go there. Humans have rarely ever been there. And being able to experience not only just how well they put everything together, but being able to see these places in their existence is what it's like probably the real, at least in my opinion, the real value of a lot of this planet Earth. Of these undisturbed areas. So I also want to ask Quinn as our guest, uh, I mean, what do you think the real, obviously this blending of storytelling versus real value, of, like I said, of like going to these remote areas? Uh, well, I mean, obviously it captures the imagination of the audience, which is important to get, you know, you on subject. And, you know, um, I think the real value is that uh, it's this TV show has brought to the front, you know, the importance of, for example, ecology just because, you know, people over here like Kate go, oh, the elephant, and then they go, oh, by the way, <laughs> it's now walking away from its mom. Um, Can you just, like, stop talking about that? Like, <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, I'll stop. Um, actually, Matt should probably stop more than me, but... <laughs> Adrian. You know. uh, anyways, it, so for the average person, is just, the average person is so far removed from you know, these occurrences, these animals, and, you know, to bring to the surface, hey, there's the, all these animals, they're pretty damn awesome, they're beautiful, they have such, you know, unique, um, for example, mating rituals and behaviors, but, you know, they might be gone in the next few years, you know, and it's mostly because of us, and so it's just, even though that the because of us part isn't so um, pronounced in these series. It's kind of enough to get people to start thinking, going, oh, I thought that animal was pretty cool. But if, you know, it's going to be gone in the next few years because of the human race, you know, should we be doing something about it? So it just brings to the forefront, you know, a discussion that we should be having. And the average person needs to kind of know about and understand what we're you know, what our planet looks like now and how, for example, how it's changed from planet Earth 1 to planet Earth 2 and, you know, as little as, like, 10 yeah. years. And then planet Earth 1, there's an entire, like, the story that they show for the polar bear is the polar bear just dying. Like, I get to learn how this polar bear died because humans suck and they can't get to food because of the ice and it's trapped on the other side. I hate this. <laughs> Which I kind of want to go before we kind of get into some of the criticisms that were brought about for Planet Earth 2 and maybe some of the possible improvements as in it, some of the other shows is kind of like what we kind of mentioned on, but not necessarily like the human effects and everything else. But they kind of show the, I guess I like to say the quote unquote dark side of nature, like all this death. Like it, obviously you're sad about the polar bears and obviously the baby elephant, but this just happens in nature all the time. We just don't have people out there filming it all the time. And then, like, even, like, in a lot of the hunting scenes that they have, where basically, as I said... Yeah, who do you root for? when the, Do you root for the yeah. seal or for the polar bear? I was rooting for the polar bear. Like, I love walruses, and I wanted that walrus to die. I was like, no, you need to feed that polar bear. But the bear. walrus has a family. He has a family, as, you as monster. Yeah. There were so yeah. many other monster. walruses. There were so many other as, walruses. As Quinn said, you usually don't end up, you, you just can't choose sides because, unfortunately, one, either the walrus ends up, the children, they lose it to a child or happens a child becomes an orphan or the polar bear di- starves. And, unfortunately, I like to put it here, as Kate said, a lot of the cute things die in these episodes because they're being hunted. Like, and so, like, this, like, and just to, like, clarify it, like, I'm fine with that, like, I understand that. And yeah, I'm like, oh no. Like, I, I, it did get to the point where it's like, this thing's cute. It's going to die. Like, that's just, that's what's going to happen. But that's how the food chain works. And so, like, that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is the stuff, like, with the turtles, because cities are horrible. And so, turtles are just walking away from the beach and getting run over by cars. And we're killing the polar bear's land. Like, that bothers me. The dark side of nature, like, I get it. Things, we eat stuff all the time. You know? It's just how the food chain works, but like 
shit that like well, we did. I know, but I know you've bugs. taken a lot of like as we've kind of talked about the baby elephants and the baby penguin scenes where. You know, like I said, you're not supposed to be disturbed. That you just have, unfortunately, that's just what happens in nature. But definitely, I think they do a great job of like showing this whole predator prey relationship, and even sometimes some of the uh, I guess interspecies relationships, like and how they like fight each other and everything else, or how they live symbiotically. Yes, that's also true. They talk about, especially in Planet Earth Two, where they talk about this relationship with the way the humans interact with a lot of the uh, yeah animals. Much more mutualistic. Yeah. <laughs> are, are, are you okay, Kate? No, I'm not, but keep going. <laughs> as Quinn I and I just... mean, but as like... Quinn, as Quinn and I just kind of laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, going on to this, uh, kind of some of the criticisms they've had of this show and possibly some improvements... One of the main uh, criticisms when Planet Earth 1 came out was they kind of glazed over and they don't really tell you, like you brought up the fact that David Attenborough mentioned, like, oh, there's only one, that's, you know, like, oh, you know, like the climate change problem and maybe there's only 100 sloths left. But they don't really actually address it that much. They kind of just glaze over it and they don't really do anything. I mean, they mention it, but it's more of an afterthought. I mean, I agree with Quinn where it's kind of brought up to the forefront because it kind of gets this whole series kind of gets the general audience involved and like those we care and you can see all the beautiful things but it doesn't really address any problems i think that's a good point because i mean when we did our bill nye episode one of our problems was that they were kind of like over the head with it it's like what what's like the where's like the the middle ground to get people to care but not to the point where people who need to know about this stuff are going to get like oh just turn it off just because you feel like you're getting preached at where we kind of felt with um the Bill Nye saves the world. Which I find interesting because I believe the Bill Nye series, which was over the top, it came out about the same time or a little after the Planet Earth 2 came out. And both of these, the section, yeah, the second sections have, or at least, yeah, excuse me, came out about the same time as Bill Nye, about the same time period as Planet Earth 2. In Planet Earth 2, they talk more about some of these negative human effects and what's going on. And they have an entire episode dedicated to cities and how they're affecting obviously like the baby turtles and other electricity type problems of like light and different between electricity, power, light and natural light. And like what, what I do like about this too, though, is like, it's science, it's fact-based, it's science-based like that, like even the negative like effects of the bringing up, it's based on that. And like people who like don't believe climate change is real, don't really have a seat at the table here. And that like their side, like that's not being presented. And I don't like, this is just straight science and like showing you the visual effects of in, instead of just like pointing to a graph right like it makes it real yeah i understand that but they're still not doing anything about it like in the thing from what you're saying so like what what do we want them to do if you know, if they do a planet earth three like what would you like to see them do to kind of rectify like that issue well before we get to like a possible planet earth three what based on the criticism back in 2006 when the first planet earth came out What they ended up doing, which obviously I actually didn't even realize this actually happened, which could make me a bad biologist (laughs) or ecologist, but apparently there was, actually to be fair, I don't believe Quinn knew this either. (laughs) Um, All this, uh, all the filmmakers and the cameramen and the biologists and, you know, other scientists they brought out and they think they notice all this like environmental degradation and all these problems happening across and all the like absence of wildlife for you two. And so they made this little mini series called Planet Earth the Future in 2007. It's only three episodes, but it's really heavily uh, as like basically you felt like thing. It's all about conservation and it's all about environmental problems. And it's based on all the actual sites and the footage that was taken from the first planet Earth and the problems they have and possibility of going through this. So is that just like a different lens, right? Because when you're talking about like ecology or like even just like the, like the bio- biology like you're not necessarily thinking about like you're presenting what's happening right there and showing the interplays and it may come up whereas if you're having a talk like if, if i like the talks we've had with the conservationists we know like that is at the forefront like <laughs> like that like that's the lens of that that conservation comes from so is it maybe just because like they're not com- coming from it from a conservationist lens or coming at it from just like a natural world lens that that's why that happened in planet world one like it's, could that like frame how people are talking about it or like how the directors and writers were going about it mm, i think that like so like as an ecologist i also um you know i've taken conservation classes you know it's 
I don't think people realize when it comes to the natural sciences, it's all kind of intertwined. So yeah. I know my chemistry, I know yeah. my genetics, I know my uh, cell biology, like, you know, but my focus is on ecology, but I, you know, in order to be a conservation biologist, you need to have a background yeah. in some sort of natural science also. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what, yeah. what they were. So, I guess it just meant like a goal. Like, yeah. Well, obviously the, a conservationist goal is to like point out all the stuff that humans are doing versus like maybe from their goal, it was like, we just want to show you this so, and bring it up as it comes okay. along. So in an, it, so, uh, basically the producer, I believe it was of planet earth or one of the main people out on the show came out to these criticism and said they didn't want to be over the top with this. And they wanted to like show it for, cause they didn't want it for primetime BBC. Cause this was primetime BBC. Uh, and so they yeah. wanted something more stunning and so like, they did adjust it. yeah. So they adjusted a lot of this to be more of like, you know, like said storytelling, and like actually observing the natural world versus like more yeah. people would be interested yeah. in that yeah. rather so that's, than maybe conservation yeah. which, like as emo- like emotional as i get from that like i do genuinely want to know about it because like how can i change my behavior like even though i'm a solitary human like how can i change my behavior to be more aware of this so i, I kept watching even though i got really sad so yeah mm-hmm. and i think it also depends at least from some of the stuff i know quinn and i we've talked about this is depending on what i guess biome or what they're looking at depends on how much they're really going to talk about some of this stuff so like in some of the like i guess family shows like blue planet which has a one and two blue planet two will rip you apart (laughs) and it's literally because the oceans per se are taking a lot of this damage it's very noticeable and it has probably one of the most like worst problems as far as like what's going on versus like if we're talking about like the mountain ranges or something or even the deserts where there are problems but they're not you're not going to see the effects as much and that makes sense yeah which also they did <laughs> like we can't get rid of this plastic bag that keeps coming into a shot in the ocean because hey pollution yeah <laughs> which led to this other thing in 20 in 2007 they did which is saving planet earth series which I don't ever think I'm going to watch this, and I kind of kind of cringe talking about it, which is unfair because I haven't watched it. But essentially, they did 11 episode series, which each episode is narrated narrated by a celebrity <laughs> to save an endangered species. So, like the yeah. first episode one is about saving gorillas, and it's done by Will Young, who is apparently some musical celebrity. I don't know who that is. Some British musical celebrity. It's pop star. Shark yeah. Week something like that yeah so it's essentially trying to get people to buy into it by giving like somebody that they like yes idolize and already give money to yes they did have like a telethon for i think they turned a lot some of this stuff into like a telethon and everything they did raise money if it's good but it is mm-hmm. it's hard for me which i've talked about i think one obviously on the shark week episode we've had and then possibly on a few things watching celebrities especially people that just have no knowledge of this try to do these like nature type documentaries and there whether even just narration and stuff it's really hard to watch for me so cringe yes <laughs> like i said i don't know if it's obviously quinn probably agrees with me but it i bothers me and i don't like it and it seems like the u.s yeah. definitely like to do it yes i could be wrong because i have to look at every single documentary but the u.s seems especially in the big like prime time type stuff we're gonna get sigourney weaver See Shark Week episode. <laughs> yes. A lot of the Shark Week stuff. <laughs> uh, so. And then, I mean, of course, there's the, also the problem that I'm sure you agree with me, Matt, that they're focusing on a single endangered species each time. Yeah, which, unfortunately, after taking plenty of conservation, they do that on purpose. Like, these whole, like, selections of one animals, like the pandas, per se, Pandas in the grand scheme of like the food chain ecosystem probably really don't matter that much. But like we, they're cute and cuddly, and people like Kate love watching them. They love seeing. Okay, don't use me for this example because I will save all the freaking sharks in the world. So don't use me as this example. <laughs> but anyway, people care about pandas because they're cute and cuddly and whatnot. So if they can get money and you know use the panda on their giant sign of conservation. They can save pandas, but what you could do is a panda habitat in the habitat range, which is obviously more than just like a size of a house. It probably can be up to like hundreds of kilometers and whatnot. You can save with everything in like under the umbrella. 
And so I believe it's almost like an umbrella type species where if you can save like a panda with a range of 200 kilometer, you know, perimeter or ah, excuse me, not perimeter, 200 kilometer, like square miles. Shit. That's not even right either. Territory. Territory. There we go. I couldn't say. Stop trying to do conversions. (laughs) 200 kilometer territories. Then you can save everything within that territory along with the pandas and you can get the general public like to care. And for it is basically marketing on a conservation level, yeah. but that's unfortunately what has to be done for to get people to care. So a lot of the stuff that you know what, what animals were on here, like what animals they targeted. Uh, they did gorilla, tigers. Shit, I can look it up. Mostly very large mammals that are in the public's eye have already been in the public's eye, uh, and most people okay. already know a lot of these are endangered, yeah. which is another one. I was like. We already know these are endangered. A lot of people already know these endangered. These are endangered. There's been a lot of other documentaries on these yeah. things. There's already a lot of charities on these things, and it's just kind of it's almost like we're lying to people, saying, "Oh yeah, we need to specifically save these species." Yeah. I know Matt's like it's an umbrella sort of thing, but like it almost seems like lying because it's not like we have to save the species. We need to save these ecosystems, these habitats. Because yeah. that's what's ultimately changing. It's not that worse. I mean, we might be specifically through like like hunting, um, you know, poaching. We might specifically be impacting these large animals, but yeah. it's also we're changing these climates. Where you know, um, cutting down these forests, we're removing fires from these ecosystems where they're naturally supposed to be. You know, we're changing the ecosystems, and that changes not just these large animals, but everything the vegetation you're changing the small mammals the insects everything yeah i figured that's what we should be highlighting but i understand the marketing ploy. yeah you have to get people to care and stop hitting the table (laughs) you have to get people (laughs) to care and people care about saving large animals like elephants like tigers crocodiles even the rhinos not saying they're not important but you can save a lot more main things the rhino is kind of important because, like, the last one died and they're about to all die out right now. So. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Like I said, you don't want to say that, but, like... <laughs> they're kind of past that point. Yeah, yeah. They, like, like they saving. really be saved. But it's one of those, yeah. like... Yeah, to teach people, but everybody knows rhinos. The general public, for a lot of times, know rhinos need to be... That are already past. Or save the whales. Yeah, they know all these. As Quinn was saying, they know all these. And so just doing more... We're going to say the stuff we already know is... <laughs> <laughs> like dying. So would you say like if any would you say that like a lot of it's like really performative? Like like hey, you can feel good about yourself because you donated to this panda fund when in reality it's not really you're not really driving any impact. Um I mean, I would say yes to that simply because, you know, charity's charity. That's good, right. you know. You, you need to, that money to, you know, uh, be able to, for example, go into, um, you know, an ecosystem that's highly degraded and try to either revert it or, um, you know, ecologically restore it. Um, obviously, that requires money. But, you know, what, the reason why it got there in the first place could possibly do to, like, things like climate change and our CO2 emissions or, you know, the nitrogen that we're putting into uh, all of our big bodies of water. And for a single, you know, a single person just giving money to a charity, that's not going to change any yeah. of those those values. It's what's going to change it is individual people changing their ways, but also on a political, a you know, uh, government, country wide basis. You know, either putting in laws saying, hey, you can't, you know, uh, your car, for example, can't put this much um, emissions into the air per year you know that's what's going to change it but it does i mean it does still get people kind of more on board and more aware of things yeah so as far as i guess for me like i agree with most of that but i think from the part of just like obviously i think it's more of an educational standpoint and a mindset standpoint and i think we have an interesting perspective because we are from the united states and other stuff and as i we kind of Briefly, t- huh? What'd you say? <laughs> she said, uh, uh. But we briefly we briefly touched on it. But a lot of these, like when they show the animal uh, human interactions, especially like this mutualistic like relationships, they're from 
other countries, obviously, they're not the United States and mainly Eastern type countries. Like they have an entire episode with the cities, which is a great episode where they dedicate it to, you know, they're shown for like 400 years. This city entirely bonds with hyenas. That was an Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia yes. Was that one? Like I said, with hyenas, they talk about with the monkeys, the different various species of monkeys that live and get along. They talk about uh, the leopards and some of the feral pigs that live in their cities and everything else. And these people just accept this and they live life with them. But to me, like we try to, I mean, not saying it never happened anywhere in the U S but it's just un, definitely unheard of. It's not very common. And definitely as we talked about one of the monkey, they talked about one of the, uh, hint, they treat some of the monkey species like a Hindu God. They literally feed them yeah. and thrive. That's just not yeah. heard of here. Yeah, the macaques in India is what they put, and there, there's a there's a Hindu god um, called Hanuman, and he's a he's a, a, a monkey god. Um, so like that entire like shrine area city, like the city where the shrine is, they like actually feed and have like helped these macaques like breed way more than they would have in the wild because of how much like how integrated they are into like their everyday life. Yeah, and so it's just. This is a different mindset. People, I mean, obviously people here, they love animals, but honestly, it just seems like unless it's a cat or a dog or maybe some cows, they don't really care that much. Yeah. I, I, think I mean, I don't want to say it about everybody, and it's an unfair statement to generalize everybody, but from the grand scheme of things, if a dog dies, we're, we're doing everything we possibly can. But if we wipe out an entire <laughs> bird species, nobody blinks an eye. Yeah. <laughs> kind of has led to which i've talked about before on the show and i'm sure quinn has heard about this this is new conservation which obviously we have to update myself because it's been a few years since i've like studied it in sense but this new conservation of everything has an economic value whether it's land yes. yeah. animals water anything of some sort has an economic value and even to an extent probably humans at this point <laughs> yeah we're we're trying to essentially um these ecosystem goods um, is what they're applying these economic values to. And the idea is simply that humans, at least the, the Western world, kind of focuses on uh, economics. So if it has value, it's important. So we need to start adding value to these uh, ecosystem goods. And uh, and if we add value to them, then they're going to become important. That's why we have... So that's kind of the idea. Yeah, which basically it. why even like this whole like tourism and like all these visit thing is so they can add value. People want to come... Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. why this whole thing kind of taken up, I guess, within the last like 20 years or 15 years or so. Mm-hmm. is because they can justify we need to keep this like state park and these parks because it has value. Not because whether we care, but it has value. Unless you're Trump and you just want to run a pipeline through it. <sighs> Adrian, are you still with us? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right here. Uh, animal good. People bad. Feeling, <laughs> feeling animal bad. Yeah. Like, how do you feel about all this stuff, Adrian? Um, I think. Well, I mean, I don't disagree really at all. Like, um. I think if we show and to go back to where we started, like we show less pawn stars and more, yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff that matters on like these supposedly education channels, then maybe we start getting that back into the public eye a little more instead of waiting, you know, 10 years for another planet Earth to come out, <laughs> show some more stuff other than people building tree houses on animal planet, which is a thing apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> My parents watch yeah. that So one. I just think it's like a, and I know like we're talking like it's like a you know Eurocentric thing, but I mean, I think humans in general were just not very yeah. good to uh, animals. Um, like, there's plenty of countries who could be doing better. We'd be doing better as a whole. Right. So, um, I know it's yeah. sounding like we're making it like a U.S. thing, but that's just where we are. So we can speak uh, more you know personally to it. But it's it's a world thing. Like, you know, we're I'm not in China killing pandas, uh, so. We just need to do better. Yeah, no, I wanted to, like, clarify. That's why I said, like, we have this different perspective from, like, the U.S. Because yeah. it definitely happens. There's entire, like, uh, black market meat markets and everything else that they're oh, just yeah. killing. And I, yeah, and I mean, too, like, I guess, like, I didn't mean it to sound like it's just, like, I just meant, like, because um, I, I have the cities thing in my mind. That, like, that episode from Planet Earth, too, because they were talking about, like, these, these architectures that they're building to actually, like, put in, like, make it more 
around keeping like plant life and stuff alive and then like also um like specifically like like the the macaques and like the hyenas and stuff like that like they're in places where like their cultural value system like nature is like built into it but i think you're right adrian like definitely like china is one of the biggest polluters for the entire world yeah, and like that's a bush meat market like, everywhere and that's not really the, just yeah. the u.s for sure <laughs> yeah and and china it they've finally kind of realized what they've been doing. That's why they've been so hard pressed to, you know, figure out, uh, solutions to these problems. Like, uh, a lot of their farming was often done on these like terraced hills and that leads to a lot of uh, soil erosion. So they've figured out various ways to, you know, keep the soil on these hills, these very fertile hills that they need. And they absolutely need for, you know, farming, but they were causing so much damage with their past uh, um, farming that they they really um, have recently figured out just kind of so really awesome kind of inventive like, ways. To... So it's kind of like once you realize how much damage you've done. Yeah, well, and they've, that they've done so much yeah. damage so well, far. That they really yeah. need to scrap. Well, this is kind of like what we've, I've, at least I've read basically a study they're doing that basically, even though China <laughs> basically has the most pollution, it's more because of how much the population, but when you break it down percentages yes. of population per like capita or something, they're actually pretty yeah. a lot lower, especially compared to like the U.S. where we do produce a lot less pollution. But for the amount of, if we put it on the same scale population wise, we are way worse. Yeah, per person, yeah. we're way yeah. worse for sure. But yeah, they're just so bad because their population is so large. But yeah. that still means they're doing a lot, yes. of, lot more damage. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, more damage. But yeah, it is something to be thought of. Like, you know, to just yelling, well, they do a lot more pollution. Well, they do, but it's because they have more people. We actually, yeah. if we had the same amount of for people, sure. we'd be doing way more. Yeah. Um, I do want to make it since we are talking about some of this stuff. I mean, we can cut out depending on thing because it's been a thought that I've had for a while of this whole thing of like, I guess, the science in the U.S. per se. And I feel like we are basically science like we because obviously we have these great universities and even education type stuff when we talk about leading everything. And I feel like we are just more of an economic science giant than we are of an actual like educational science giant where we have the funding and the resources to be able to do a lot of the science, but we don't have the necessarily care or like trying to break through of technology, if that makes sense. I think that kind of goes back to what Adrian said, like our, (laughs) like our channels just went from like, what's going to make us money. We're going to go ahead and make tree house. Yeah. Yeah, like, if you do the education – because, like, the reason why I started watching this stuff, because I remember back in elementary school, we did projects where we had to, like, pick an animal and do a whole bunch of research on it. Um, but I don't know if that's stuff that people do anymore in in science classes. And you definitely can't see it on TV because you watch Pawn Stars and or you watch, you know, yeah. Treehouse Show or How to Make a Super Fancy, you know, fish tank, uh, fish tank <laughs> instead of watching, you know, instead of caring about the actual fish who are in the tank. I you guess know, the, so. Yeah, the, right the whole thing I've been thinking about is literally like if we, basically we kind of have a lot of scientists or whatever we breed, but it's only literally because we have a much like a higher economy. Whereas if we basically took our economy and doing it, we have more money to spend in science, but we don't do it actually efficient at all. So where if we actually put our budget, what same like say one of the you know lower end countries, our science would drop even probably way worse, and we only benefit to look like we lead in science or do anything because we have the money to spend and it looks like we do this if that makes sense at all yeah. no I, th- I think that makes sense too because like you have like a lot of other countries who like not only put money into science but then like value those scientists and like actually have listen them to them in putting <laughs> into their politics and like the leader of the science commission isn't a dude who believes that cli- climate change is fake like yeah it's they actually like value the scientists and so like they're able to take the education that they give them and like put a value like yeah like they're putting a yeah. value on it like i mean I guess it's one of those i'm get like if, have if, jobs and influence what's yeah happening. basically if we have a budget where both science budget for two countries is 30 million the problem is out of the overall budget one country's that 30 million makes up 60 percent, and the other budget makes up 10 so who really actually cares and I think, like, it honestly, though, it wouldn't be a problem if we actually valued our scientists. Like, if we actually said, hey, I'm just a politician who has no idea what science is, and I have no idea what's best for this environment. Let's actually go to people who have spent their entire lives finding out 
what is best for the environment. Studying and researching. Yes. Okay. Give Quinn a job and, and, and give Quinn, Quinn a job. She'll please, save you please. <laughs> we don't, we're not getting into that route of jobs of what we do with things. <laughs> uh, um, so I guess, obviously, to kind of wrap it up without trying to go into all the political standpoints of everything else, because it is one of those, we can do this for a while. For one, it can go back and forth we talk, but it could lead into, unfortunately, kind of what Adrian says where this backlash of people just don't want to listen to this stuff. And so this whole blend of like trying to tell people and teaching people everything without, I guess, feel like they're yelling at them. Uh, so I guess any final thoughts about, about all I had for the most part. So like the one thing I did want to point out that you didn't have on here was just like the footage from Planet Earth 2 and Blue Planet and stuff is being used by like conservation. Yes, groups that is true. To like, like it, it's been like it's given like this it's given them a tool that people can watch to actually say, hey, my conservation group is actually working on, you know, pulling straws out of sea turtle's nose. Like, wa- like, you can watch this, and then you can say, hey, we're actually working to help stop plastic, you know, polluting thing, po- polluting the ocean, like, that type of stuff. Like, it's given, it's kind of, like, given conservationists, like, a, like it may not be in the show, but it's given them a tool to kind of show people. Right. For at least from, like, the people I follow on Twitter. <laughs> Like, bringing it back around to that. That's also how I found out how Blue, Blue Planet's going to wreck me. Blue Planet 2 will wreck you. That's for sure. Yeah. That, that is my final thought. Like, I think it's... it's. I think I just said this on the D&D episode. It's a great learning tool. <laughs> <laughs> if if it's used the right way, like Adrian said, like, hi, like we need more of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just highlight this. I mean, if you want to go watch Animals Be Pretty and stuff, this is definitely... Uh, uh, an easy tool i think if you want to get like your kids interested in you know nature and science i don't think anything that they say is kind of like um over the top and and stuff i think anyone can understand what's going on in these these biomes so definitely one of the best documentaries i have seen and if they do a planet earth three uh let's go to space just kidding uh you cannot get yeah. vin diesel in space in planet earth three adrian Let's do it. <laughs> Vin Diesel narrating Planet Earth 3. I'm all about As it. As Dominic Trump. <sighs> all about it. Yeah, I love Planet Earth. I love documentaries like this. Um, I hope this. I hope we get some more traction. Of just, can you do your part, man? Don't throw trash on the floor. You, you might not think you can affect a change for pandas, but you can at least affect a change for, you know, the stray dog on the street who's going to pick up your trash and get sick and die. You know, just just do better. I mean, obviously, I've been studying biology and kind of ecology and whatnot for the last, I don't know how many years. <laughs> Took it for way too much educational stuff. Um, but as far as, so, I mean, this is the, this series in general, it highlights a lot of great things and definitely just what it shows and great. And definitely not like over the top, like he said, but it is a great, like, great general audience to get people interested, as Adrian said. And I do like some of these, but I, but unlike, I mean, like Adrian said with the Bill Nye, I, as a, from a science standpoint and scientist person, I kind of enjoy when they go over the top because I feel it gets ignored a lot. And like Blue Planet Earth or Blue Planet 2, there are some scenes that they, I think they literally do it on purpose to make you want to cry, to make you cry to understand this stuff. And I know that's harsh and it's cuts you to be borderline if you want to say cruel to cry or something for this, but I feel like at this point it is necessity and like I enjoyed the Bill Nye episode and Bill Nye season the way he's done things because unfortunately I think the way we progressed with especially from Blue Planet uh, from Planet Earth 1 to Planet Earth 2 there hasn't been much done it seems like I know it's there's a lot of stuff unfortunately that we don't see because I know the UK is definitely stepping up banning a lot of stuff between a lot of plastics and a lot of other stuff but it just I don't want to say it doesn't go on where we live, but it just doesn't seem like it is, and it's not that important. And sometimes it's hard to see. Uh, yeah, like in Austin, we can still buy plastic. We can still, like, 
plastic bags are illegal, but we can still buy them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, too. Like, even though we moved back to El Paso where they don't do the plastic bag thing, we still use our uh, our reusable bags whenever we go to the grocery store just because we already have them. And why do we need the plastic bags if we already have all of this other We're not going to get a plastic bag because I will rant on that because either eliminate them all together, but don't tell me they're bad and we can't have plastic bags, but you're going to sell me a damn plastic bag. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as far I think everybody should watch these. Um, even if just from the just out of the curiosity of learning about planet Earth, even if you don't like learning it from necessarily a giant scientific standpoint, but just seeing what is what goes on in nature. Like my favorite scene still is probably the grasslands being set on fire between the music they do with that and the gazelle running. It is very amazing because Quinn talked about fire suppression, and obviously I worked a lot with plants. That was kind of more my like ecology type part. It, fire suppression is awful for the environment, and it's terrible, and it's just something that unfortunately we have to do. I mean, they do have controlled burning, but you can't always control them, and there are wildfires. But, I mean, it's something that definitely probably one of the things that is very detrimental to ecosystem that is not talked about as much as we talk about the human stuff you know between plastics and other things fire suppression kills a lot of stuff and it allows a lot of invasive species to live and it basically stops succession from happening like a lot of these like like you can do yes. safe, you know um yeah. prescribed fires but most people just go oh fires evil. yeah fires bad yeah people don't the general public doesn't quite understand and for ecologists in order to do these conservation you know work this management work you have to have the public yes on your side in order to do these things so certain places um have started to get the public on their side um but not all places that you know this sort of management work needs to be done in but yeah uh i think some definitely there everybody should check out for at least once even if you just like, and like I said, even if you're not even into like science or nature part or anything, if you're into photography, cinematography, even music, like the way this is done, I feel like you should do to possibly learn to increase anything for as an overall whole. But it is something that's great for the general audience at prime time. I do have, I do see its issues, but for what it was trying to do and to get everybody to watch it, like Planet Earth 2 just had 10 million viewers first episode when it just d- debuted. To get those type of numbers, you need shows like that to get people to watch. Because even about ten million, if you can get you know a hundred thousand that care, you've done something. I, I agree with all of the points made, but um, just specifically um, when it comes to like Planet Earth and Blue Planet and all these other different shows, it's uh, really like it can be a conversation starter, a, you know, a discussion starter. And so if you are you know, like, you watch Planet Earth 2 and go, oh, well, you know, I see all this destruction going on. How can I help? That's that's then a discussion starter. And, you know, you can go do your research. And, you know, Google's amazing. You just go to Google and type <laughs> Google things it. in. Just Google it. <laughs> and it's, it's best to, you know, Google specific sites that, you know, um, special on specialize on these topics and aren't being, for example, funded by uh, oil companies, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in general, I think this is a very good discussion starter. You know, for what it is, it's very enjoyable. Cinema, you know, uh, it plays like a movie. It's storytelling. It's narrative. Um, it's just very, very pleasant to just sit down and watch. Um, but if you want to learn more about it, you know, it's pretty easy to just kind of look up that sort of information and, you know, just start talking to people in general if you're actually interested in this stuff. Sounds good by everybody. Um, Kate, take us out. Thank you again, Quinn, for coming on here. It was a pleasure. Um, so why don't we go ahead and tell people where they can find you? Oh, yeah. So I am on Instagram as, uh horror shadows and <laughs> you, gotta, says, you, gotta, you gotta emphasize that last you want to spell that a little bit shadows? <laughs> no, horror horror okay there you go r o r shadows horror <laughs> shadows sorry <laughs> um and yeah I'm, I'm on twitter twitter as horror shadows and actually my instagram is midnight dot visitor not horror shadows. Yeah, it's not horror shadows. Nobody's following you now. They're all confused. Sorry. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. Everyone's confused. It's all right. I don't really do social media that much anyways, so. But you do have a certain cosplay corner that you do. Oh, yes. I do the cosplay corner on uh, butwhythopodcast.com. So. Yeah, I'm surprised Matt didn't call you a lovely blogger. I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no. You, didn't re- you reminded him. Yeah. They're yeah. an ecologist first, blogger second. Yeah. Um, and you can find our podcast at But Why Though PC on Twitter and on Facebook.com slash But Why Though PC. If you want to support us more, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash But Why Though PC. And make sure you check out our website where we have all of our, Matt. Our lovely bloggers. Yes. Who write, who write stuff throughout the month about the things they care about, reviews. Um, we have everything over there. Check it out, but why though podcast.com. Uh, you can find me at Oh My Myth Randier on Instagram and Twitter. Adrian? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at SuperReese93, S U P E R R U I Z 93. I always love how you spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> Matt? And you can find me in the Cedar Forest. <laughs>